Little House on the Prairie, chapter 25. It's called Soldiers. So here's a picture of them working in the field. And there's Pa plowing with Pet and Patty. After the Indians had gone, a great peace settled on the prairie. And one morning, the whole land was green. When did that grass grow? Ma asked in amazement. I thought the whole country was black, and now there's nothing but green grass as far as the eye can see. The whole sky was filled with lines of wild ducks and wild geese flying north. Crows cawed in the trees above the creek. The wind whispered in the new grass, bringing scents of earth and of growing things. In the mornings, the meadow larks rose singing in the sky. All day, the curlews and the killdeers and the sandpipers chirped and sang in the creek bottoms. Often in the early evening, the mockingbirds were singing. One night, Pa and Mary and Laura sat still on the doorstep, watching little rabbits playing in the grass in the starlight. Three rabbit mothers hopped about with loping ears and watched their little rabbits playing too. In the daytime, everyone was busy. Pa hurried with his plowing and Mary and Laura helped Ma plant the early garden seeds. With the hoe, Ma dug small holes in the matted grass roots that the plow had turned up and Laura and Mary carefully dropped the seeds. Then Ma covered them snugly with earth. They planted onions and carrots and peas and beans and turnips. And they were all so happy because spring had come and pretty soon they would have vegetables to eat. They were growing tired of just bread and meat. One evening, Pa came from the field before sunset and he helped Ma set out the cabbage plants and the sweet potato plants. Ma sowed the cabbage seed in a flat box and kept it in the house. She watered it carefully and carried it every day from the morning sunshine to the afternoon sunshine that came through the windows and she had saved one of the Christmas sweet potatoes and planted it in another box. The cabbage seeds were now little gray green plants and the sweet potato had sent up a stem with green leaves from every one of its eyes. Pa and Ma took each tiny plant very carefully and settled its roots comfortably in holes made for them. They watered the roots and pressed earth upon them firmly. It was dark before the last plant was in its place and Pa and Ma were tired, but they were glad to because this year they'd have cabbages and sweet potatoes. Every year they all looked at, oh sorry, every day they all looked at that garden. It was rough and grassy because it was made of prairie sod, but all the tiny plants were growing. Little crumpled leaves of peas came up and tiny spears of onions. The beans themselves popped out of the ground, but it was a little yellow bean stem coiled like a spring that pushed them up. Then the bean was cracked open and dropped by two baby bean leaves and the leaves unfolded flat to the sunshine. Pretty soon they would all begin to live like kings. Every morning, Pa went cheerfully whistling to the field. He had planted some early saw potatoes and some potatoes were saved to plant later. Now he carried a sack of corn fastened to his belt. And as he plowed, he threw grains of corn into the furrow beside the plow's point. The plow turned over a strip of sod on top of the seed corn, but the corn would fight its way up through the matted roots and there would be a cornfield. There would be green corn for dinner someday. And next winter, there would be ripe corn for Pet and Patty to eat. One morning, Mary and Laura were washing the dishes and Ma was making the beds. She was humming softly to herself and Laura and Mary were talking about the garden. Laura liked peas best and Mary liked beans. Suddenly, they heard Pa's voice loud and angry. Ma went quietly to the door and Laura and Mary peeked out on either side of her. Pa was driving Pet and Patty from the field, dragging the plow behind them. Mr. Scott and Mr. Edwards were with Pa and Mr. Scott was talking earnestly. No, Scott, Pa answered him. I'll not stay here to be taken away by the soldiers like an outlaw. If some blasted politician in Washington hadn't sent out word, it would be all right to settle here. I never would have been three miles over the line into Indian territory, but I'll not wait for the soldiers to take us out. 
We're going now. What's the matter, Charles? Ma asked. Where are we going? Darned if I know, but we're going. We're leaving here. Scott and Edward say the government is sending soldiers to take all of us settlers out of Indian territory. His face was red and his eyes were like blue fire. Laura was frightened. She had never seen Pa look like that. She pressed close against Ma and was still looking at Pa. Mr. Scott started to speak, but Pa stopped him. Save your breath, Scott. It's no use to say another word. You can stay till the soldiers come if you want to. I'm going now. Mr. Edwards said he was going too. He would not stay to be driven across the line like an ornery yellow hound dog. Ride out to Independence with us, Edwards, Pa said. But Mr. Edwards answered that he didn't care to go north. He would make a boat and go on down the river to some settlement far south. Better to come with us, Pa urged him, and go down on foot through Missouri. It's a risky trip, one man alone in a boat going down the Burdigris among the wild Indian tribes. But Mr. Edwards said he had already seen Missouri and he had plenty of powder and lead for his gun. Then Pa told Mr. Scott to take the cow and to take the calf. We can't take them with us, Pa said. You've been a good neighbor, Scott, and I'm sorry to leave you, but we're going in the morning. Laura had heard all of this, but she had not believed it until she saw Mr. Scott leading away the cow. The gentle cow went meekly away with the rope around her long horns and the calf frisked and jumped behind. There went all the milk and butter. Mr. Edward said he would be busy, too busy to see them again. So he shook hands with Pa saying, good luck to you Ingalls, goodbye and good luck. He shook hands with Ma too and said, goodbye ma'am, I won't be seeing you again, but I sure will never forget your kindness. Then he turned to Mary and Laura and he shook their hands as if they were grown-ups. Goodbye, he said. Mary said politely, goodbye, Mr. Edwards. But Laura forgot to be polite. She said, oh, Mr. Edwards, I wish you wouldn't go. Oh, Mr. Edwards, thank you, thank you for going all the way to Independence to find Santa Claus for us. Mr. Edwards' eyes shone very bright and he went away without saying another word. Oh, I think he was starting to cry. This is so sad. Okay, here's a picture of the men saying goodbye. So that's Mr. Edwards shaking Pa's hand. And that's Mr. Scott leading away the cow and the calf. Pa began to unhitch Pet and Patty in the middle of the morning and Laura and Mary knew it was really true. They were really going away from here. Ma didn't say anything. She went into the house and looked around at the dishes, not washed, and at the bed, only partly made, and she lifted up both of her hands and she sat down. Mary and Laura went on doing the dishes. They were afraid not to let them make a sound. They were afraid not to let them make a sound. They turned around quickly when Pa came. He looked like himself again, and he was carrying a potato sack. Here you are, Caroline, he said, and his voice sounded natural. Cook a plenty for dinner. We're going to without potatoes, saving them for seeds. Now we've got to eat them all up. So that day for dinner, they ate all the potatoes they meant to keep for seeds. They were very good. And Laura knew that Pa was right when he said, there's no great loss without some small gain. So something good comes of everything. After dinner, he took the wagon bows from the pig pens in the barn. Sorry. After dinner, he took the wagon bows off their pegs in the barn. So the wagon bows are these things that make, that they put on the top of the wagon to make their cover. He put them on the wagon, one end of each bow in its iron strap on one side of the wagon box and the other end in its iron strap on the other. When all the bows were standing up in their places, Ma and Pa spread the wagon cover over them and tied it down tightly. Then Pa pulled the rope in the end of the wagon cover until it pluckered together and only left a tiny round hole in the middle of the back. There stood the covered wagon, all ready to load in the morning. Everyone was quiet that night. Even Jack felt that something was wrong and he lay down close to Laura when she went to bed. It's so funny, my dog barks so many times when I'm talking about Jack. <laughs> but the mailman's here. But anyway, it was funny because right when I said 
Even Jack felt that something was wrong. My dog barked. Even Jack felt that something was wrong and he lay down close to Laura when she went to bed. It was now too warm for a fire, but Pa and Ma sat looking at the ashes in the fireplace. Ma sighed gently and said, a whole year gone, Charles. But Pa answered cheerfully by saying, what's a year amount to? We have all the time there is. Okay, and now for our final chapter. It's called Going Out. So they're leaving. After breakfast next morning, Pa and Ma packed the wagon. First, all the bedding was made into two beds, laid on top of each other across the back of the wagon and carefully covered with a pretty plaid blanket. Mary and Laura and baby Carrie would ride there in the daytime. At night, the top bed would be put in the front of the wagon for Pa and Ma to sleep in, and Mary and Laura would sleep in the bottom bed where it was. Next, Pa took the small cupboard from the wall and in it packed the food and the dishes. Pa put the cupboard under the wagon seat and in front of it, he laid a sack of corn for the horses. It'll make a good rest for our feet, Caroline, he said to Ma. Ma then packed all the clothing in two carpet bags and Pa hung them to the wagon bows on either side of the wagon. Opposite them, he hung his rifle in its straps and his bullet pouch and his powder horn hung beneath it. His fiddle and his box he laid at one end of the bed where it would rise softly. Ma wrapped the black iron spider, that's what they cooked on, the bake oven and the coffee pot in the sacks and put them in the wagon. While Pa tied the rocking chair and the tub outside and hung the water bucket and the horse bucket underneath. And he put the tin lantern carefully in the front corner of the wagon box where the sack of corn held it still. Now the wagon was loaded. The only thing they could not take with them with the plow was the plow. Well, that could not be helped. There was just no room for it. When they came to wherever they were going, Pa could get more furs to trade and get another plow. Lori and Mary climbed into the wagon and sat on the bed in the back. Ma put baby Carrie between them. They were all freshly washed and combed. Pa said they were clean as a hound's tooth and Ma told them they were bright as new pins. Then Pa hitched Pet and Patty to the wagon. Ma climbed to her place on the seat and held the lines. And suddenly Laura wanted to see the house again. She asked Pa please to let her look out. So he loosened the rope in the back of the wagon cover and that made a large round hole. Laura and Mary could look out, but still the rope held up enough canvas to keep Carrie from stumbling into the feed boxes. So this is them looking out the back. That's what they wanted to do. The snug log house looked just as it always had. It did not seem to know they were going away. Pa stood a moment in the doorway and looked all around inside. He looked at the bedstead and the fireplace and the glass windows. Then he closed the door carefully, leaving the lack string out. Someone might need shelter, he said when he left the door open. He climbed to his place beside Ma, gathered the reins into his own hands and chirped to Pet and Patty. Jack went under the wagon. Pet whinnied to Bunny who came to walk beside her and they were off. Just before the creek road went down into the bottoms, Pa stopped the Mustangs and they all looked back. As far as they could see, to the east and to the south and to the west, nothing was moving on all the vastness of the high prairie. Only the green grass was rippling in the wind and white clouds were drifting in the high clear sky. It's a great country, Caroline, Pa said, but there will be Indians and wolves here for many, many a long day. The little log house and the little stable sat lonely in the stillness. Then Pet and Patty briskly started forward. The wagon went down from the bluffs and into the Wood Creek bottoms and high in a treetop a mockingbird began to sing. I never heard a mockingbird sing so early, said Ma and Pa an answered her softly. He's telling us goodbye. They rode down through the low hills to the creek. The ford was low and an easy crossing. On they went across the bottoms where antlered deer stood up to watch them passing and where mother deer and their fawns bounded into the shadow of the woods. 
and up between the steep red earth cliffs, the wagon climbed up to the prairie again. And there's a picture of them down going by the creek and the animals are there. And then they're gonna go back up on the prairie. Pet and Patty were eager to go. Their hoofs made a muffled sound in the bottoms, but now their hoofs rang hard on the prairie and the wind sang shrill against the foremost wagon bows. Pa and Ma were still and silent on the wagon seat and Mary and Laura were quiet too, but Laura felt all excited inside. You never know what will happen next, nor where you'll be tomorrow when you're traveling in a covered wagon. At noon, Pa stopped beside a little spring to let the Mustangs eat and drink and rest. The spring would soon be dry in the summer's heat, but there was plenty of water there now. Ma took cold cornbread and meat from the food box and they all ate, sitting on the clean grass in the shade of the wagon. They drank from the spring and Laura and Mary ran around to the grass picking wildflowers while Ma tidied the food box and, Pat and Pa hitched up Pet and Patty again. Then for a long time they went on across the prairie, the grass blowing, the sky above them, and the endless wagon track. Now and then a rabbit bounded away. Sometimes a prairie hen with her brood of prairie tricks scuttled out of sight in the grass. Baby Carrie slept and Mary and Laura were almost asleep when they heard Pa say, something's wrong there. Laura jumped up and far ahead on the prairie, she saw a smite, small light colored bump. She couldn't see anything else unusual. Where, she asked Pa. There, Pa said, nodding toward the bump. It isn't moving. Laura didn't say anymore. She kept looking and she saw that the bump was a covered wagon and slowly it grew bigger in their view. She saw that no horses were hitched to it. Nothing moved anywhere around it. Then she saw something dark in front of it. The dark thing was two people sitting on the wagon's tongue. There were a man and a woman. They sat looking down at their feet and they moved only their heads to look up when Pet and Patty stopped in front of them. What's wrong? Where are your horses? Pa asked. I don't know, the man said. I tied them to the wagon last night and this morning they were gone. Somebody cut the ropes and took them away in the night. What about your dog? Pa asked. Haven't got a dog, the man said. Jack stayed under the wagon. He didn't growl, but he didn't come out. He was a sensible dog and he knew what to do when he met strangers. Well, your horses are gone, Pa told the man. You'll never see them again. Hanging's too good for horse thieves. Yes, the man answered. Pa looked at Ma and Ma barely nodded. And then Pa said, come on, ride with us to independence. No, the man said, all we've got is this wagon. We won't leave it. Why, what will you do? Pa exclaimed. There may be nobody along here for days or weeks. You can't stay here. I don't know, the man answered. We'll, we'll stay with our wagon, the woman said. She was looking down at her hands clasped in her lap and Laura couldn't see her face, but she could see only the side of the sunbonnet. You better come, Pa told them. You can always come back for your wagon. No, the woman said. They wouldn't leave the wagon. Everything they owned in the world was in it. So at last, Pa drove on, leaving them sitting on their wagon tongue all along on the prairie. Pa muttered to himself, tender feet, everything they own and no dog to watch it didn't keep watch himself and tied his horses with ropes? Pa snorted. Shouldn't be allowed loose west of the Mississippi, these tender feet. So Pa is saying like he shouldn't have been a pioneer. He should have stayed where he was because he obviously doesn't know how to take care of it properly. But Charles, what will become of them? Ma asks. There are soldiers in independence, Pa said. I'll tell the captain and he'll send out men to bring them in. They can hold out that long, but it's darned lucky for them that they that we came by. If we hadn't, there's no telling when they would have been found. Laura watched that lonely wagon until it was only a small lump on the prairie and then a speck and then it was gone. All the rest of that day, Pa drove on and on. They didn't see anybody else. When the sun was setting, Pa stopped by a well. A house had once been there, but it was burned. 
The well held plenty of good water and Laura and Mary gathered bits of half burned wood to make the fire while Pa unhitched and watered the horses and put them on the picket lines. Then Pa took the seat down from the wagon and lifted out the food box. The fire burned beautifully and Ma quickly got supper. Everything was just as it used to be before they built the house. Pa and Ma and Carrie were on the wagon seat. Laura and Mary sat on the wagon's tongue. They ate the good supper, hot from the campfire. Pet and Patty and Bunny munched on good grass and Laura saved bits for Jack, who mustn't beg, but could eat his spill as soon as supper was over. Then the sky went down far away in the west and it was time to make the camp ready for night. Pa chained Pet and Patty to the feed box at the end of the wagon. He chained Bunny to the side and he fed them all their supper of corn. Then he sat by the fire and smoked his pipe while Ma tucked Mary and Laura into bed and laid baby Carrie beside them. She sat down beside Pa at the fire and Pa took out his fiddle from the box and began to play. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. And Pa began to sing with the fiddle more and more. I went to California with a wash pan on my knee. And every time I thought of home, I wish it wasn't me. Do you know, Caroline, I've been thinking what fun the rabbits will have eating that garden that we planted. Don't, Charles, Ma said. Oh, never mind, Caroline, Pa said. We'll make a better garden. Anyway, we're taking more out of Indian territory than we took into it. I don't know what, Ma said, and Pa answered. Why, there's the mule. Then Ma laughed, and Pa and the fiddle sang. In Dixie land, I'll stand my, make my stand and live and die in Dixie. Away, away, away down south in Dixie. They sang with a lilt and a swing that almost lifted Laura right out of bed. She must lie still though and not wake Carrie. Ma was sleeping too, but Laura had never been wider awake. She heard Jack making his bed under the wagon. He was turning round and round, trampling down the grass. Then he curled into the round nest with a flop and sighed a sigh of satisfaction. Pet and Patty were munching the last of their corn and their chains rattled. Bunny lay down beside the wagon. They were all there together, safe and comfortable for the night under the wide starlit sky. Once more, the covered wagon was home. The fiddle began to play a marching tune and Pa's clear voice was singing like a deep toned bell. And we'll rally around the flag boys, we'll rally once again, shouting the battle cry, freedom. Laura felt she must shout out too, but Ma softly looked in through the round hole. Charles, Ma said, Laura is wide awake. She can't go to sleep on such music as that. Pa didn't answer, but the voice of the fiddle changed. Softly and soaringly, it began to play a long, swingy rhythm that seemed to rock Laura gently. She felt her eyes closing. She began to drift over endless waves of prairie grass, and Pa's voice went on singing. Row away, for the water's so blue, like a feather. We're sailing a rum tree canoe. Row the boat lightly, love over the sea. Daily and nightly, I'll watch over thee. And that's the end. So, it's such a piece of history. The government opened up the land and told them they could go into Indian territory. And then they went into Indian territory and they didn't realize the Indians were right there, but just away on a buffalo hunt. Then when the Indians came back and found the settlers there, they didn't like it. And then the government decided to move the Indians and also protect the Indian territory some. So he, they kept a border of it and Pa had built the house right over the border. So they, their house was built in Indian territory, so they had to leave. Um, but as you can tell, they're, you know, they're pioneers, they're minimalists. They just take what they need and they go. I will post on Google Classroom a really cool map that shows where they went and how far they went. And then the last thing I wanted to show you guys is the rest of the series. So this is the next one, it's called on the banks of Plum Creek. 
Um, and that one's really good. We may read that in third grade, or you might want to read that on your own. This one is called Farmer Boy, and it's next in the series. But Farmer Boy is about when um, Mary, when Laura grows up, she marries a man named Almanzo. And this is him when he's little. So this sort of switches gear. He becomes the main character, and it talks about um, while they're living on... Well, while the Wilders are on the Western Prairie, Almanzo is living, and his last name is Wilder. So her name was Ingalls, and so the Ingalls are living out on the prairie, and the Wilders live upstate New York, which is really farmy, and they live on a farm, and Almanzo lives there, and he grows up there. And then eventually, Almanzo Wilder meets Laura Ingalls, and they get married, and so her name becomes Laura Ingalls Wilder. So this one is about Almanzo. And this is a really good one about him growing up on a farm in um, upstate New York. And then the next one is called, sorry, that was the third one. The next one, the next one's called By the Shores of Silver Lake. And then The Long Winter. And then there's one called Little Town on the Prairie, which I don't have here. Little Town on the Prairie, and then these Happy Golden Years. And then the last one's called The First Four Years. So in this one, Laura is grown up and she marries Monzo, and this is where they meet. So the stories tell her whole life. And they're so good because just like the ones you've heard so far, they talk a lot about like what's happening at the time and they're all true and based on her real life. So it's a great way to learn about history of the time. Okay, I've enjoyed reading them to you and I hope you learned something from that amazing classic series of historical fiction. Can't wait to see you in person, yay!